scientists from all over the world gather in San Francisco for the sixth International AIDS Conference. It's just over two years since dispatchers first argued that the conventional wisdom on AIDS was misguided and that the virus HIV was not the cause of the disease at all. The program won Britain's top award for television journalism. Tonight, dispatchers returns to the AIDS trail and goes even further, arguing that AIDS as we know it may well not even be infectious. But a word of caution. Tonight's program does not argue that all thoughts of safe sex can now be discounted. Indeed, for high-risk groups, safe sex may well be the government's only accurate piece of advice. But until we accept that all the orthodox AIDS thinking could be wrong, we shall continue to be victims of the AIDS catch. It was here, at Berkeley Campus, University of California, that the genetic structure of a newly identified group of viruses was first discovered by Professor Peter Duesberg and his colleagues. They came to be called retroviruses and can live harmlessly in their host cell. When the retrovirus HIV was announced as the cause of AIDS, Peter Duesberg's 25 years of experience in the field convinced him that HIV couldn't destroy the immune system in the way that was being claimed. In other words, HIV could not cause AIDS. I don't think we have found the cause of AIDS. If we had found it, we would have stopped AIDS. We would be treating people with AIDS successfully, curing them, and we would have predicted, or we could make a more accurate prediction, how AIDS is spreading or behaving or who is going to be infected by it. None of this has been accomplished. That's the hallmark of a poorly grounded hypothesis, the virus AIDS hypothesis. Six years had passed since the first claims were made about HIV, and the HIV issue remains even more in doubt. In fact, everything we currently accept about AIDS can be turned on its head. An increasing number of leading scientists are now questioning HIV as the cause of AIDS. One of the difficulties with ascribing the virus to be the cause of AIDS is that one has not demonstrated clearly that the virus will cause AIDS in an experimental animal. And that gap in our findings at the moment produces a question. I don't think the cause of AIDS has been found, I think in a disease as complex as AIDS, that there are likely to be multiple causes. In fact, even to call it a single disease when there are so many multiple manifestations seems to me to be an oversimplification. I think assuming that HIV is the sole cause, the exclusive cause, is the wrong model. This program traces evidence that contradicts HIV as the cause of AIDS. We question whether AIDS is an infectious disease at all, and tell the stories of long-term survivors of HIV and AIDS who are in perfect health, like Tom, HIV positive for eight years, and Anna, also HIV positive eight years. Sam, who has Kaposi's sarcoma, an AIDS disease but no trace of HIV. We talk to Michael Callan, HIV positive eight years with AIDS symptoms in the past, but fit and well now. And Ron Wiebeck, who had HIV and an AIDS-linked brain disease, but there's no trace of either now. First of all, we must distinguish between AIDS and HIV. AIDS is a syndrome we shall argue is not infectious. And HIV, a retrovirus which is infectious, though extremely difficult to transmit, has nothing to do with AIDS and is simply an indication of high-risk behavior. HIV does very little in a human host. It infects it with great difficulty because it's very hard to pick up from somebody. And once it infects him, it spreads mildly or poorly into a few T cells and B cells, lymphocytes, and occasionally then during that original spread before the immune system responds to it may cause a glandular fever. That has been reported in a few studies. Very rare apparently. And from then on, it's neutralized by the immune system within a couple of weeks or months after the infection, and it does nothing anymore for the rest of your life. 
Of the millions of T cells that form part of our immune system, HIV is only capable of infecting one in 500 T cells where it lies dormant. And HIV only actively infects at most one in 10,000 T cells. Every two days, the body regenerates T cells at a rate of 5%, 500 times faster than HIV can actively infect them. So HIV can't be seen to do any harm in the body and can live happily in its host cell. If HIV is so ineffectual, why then is it the accepted view that it's the cause of AIDS? We put this to Harvard molecular biologist Professor Walter Gilbert. The general public accepts what the media uh, tells them and the media has blown up the virus as the cause of AIDS. And the scientific community, parts of it, have blown up the virus as the cause of AIDS because it is more convenient to have a neat explanation than to be in that situation, which we often are in science, at which the problem, the questions, still face us and our knowledge proceeds gradually to overcome those difficulties. I think people want to believe in HIV. People have profound feelings about HIV and what I, I, I call them HIV fundamentalists. Author of AIDS, the HIV Myth, one of the first books to challenge HIV as the cause of AIDS, Jad Adams has long been suspicious of the HIV hypothesis and in particular of the way the virus was brought to public attention. HIV was announced to be the cause of AIDS at a press conference in America uh, in April of 1984. Health Secretary Margaret Hepler made the announcement to a packed news conference. The probable cause of AIDS has been found. She then introduced the scientist who led the team, Dr. Robert Gallo. It was rather interesting that that press conference uh, was held before publication in the scientific papers, in the scientific press, which is almost always uh, the, the precursor of a discussion about whether you've genuinely got the cause, whether, whether you've genuinely got a discovery. In Paris, at the Pasteur Institute where HIV was first identified, even Professor Luc Montagnier, who pioneered early HIV work, has moved away from the notion that HIV on its own can cause AIDS. Had he always believed it was sufficient to cause the disease? Uh, at first, yes, we thought we had the best, the best candidate, uh, is virus. Uh, for this virus to be the cause of AIDS, but uh, after a while, even from the beginning actually, we, we thought maybe uh, for the activation of that virus in cells, we uh, had to, we need some cofactors. So I would agree that HIV by itself, or some styles of HIV, are not sufficient to induce AIDS. If the role of HIV is now being questioned by leading scientists, how does that affect the way we look at AIDS? What, in fact, is AIDS? In 1987, the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, USA, revised and broadened its definition of AIDS, listing 25 diseases. So many different diseases points away from one single viral cause, argues Peter Duesberg. AIDS is a collection or syndrome of 25 old diseases, conventional diseases. Not one of them is known. They've all been known for centuries, or at least for decades, with the provision that you have to find antibody to HIV or, you, or virus or some other traces of that virus. When they are found, then those who believe in the virus as a cause of AIDS say those 25 diseases, any one of them or combination of them, were caused by the virus. For example, if you have tuberculosis and you find HIV, they say HIV has done it. Eighty years ago, hundred years ago, Robert Koch used to say it's tuberculosis bacillus that has done it. AIDS doesn't seem to behave like an infectious disease because it remains within the high-risk groups. In the USA, 92%, and in the UK, 95% of those who get AIDS are men who are either intravenous drug users, active homosexuals, or both. No infectious agent could be that selective. So is AIDS infectious at all? Before discussing this, we should take a careful look at what we've most often been told about HIV and AIDS and clear up some existing misconceptions. Most of us have heard that if you got HIV, you would certainly get AIDS and would certainly die. It was simply a matter of when. It is a deadly disease and there is no known cure. 
The virus can be passed during sexual intercourse with an infected person. Anyone can get it, man or woman. And the latency period between infection and full-blown AIDS has been stretched from one year to five years to ten years, and now some suggest even longer depending on risk behavior. The goalposts are constantly being moved, and more and more contradictions to the viral AIDS hypothesis are emerging. For example, only a small proportion of HIV-positive people ever develop full-blown AIDS. In the USA, in any one year, only 1.5% of the estimated HIV positives get AIDS. This means that 98.5% don't get AIDS. I believe I've been HIV positive since at least 1982 because I was with my lover at that time who died of AIDS in 1984. I have no symptoms whatsoever. I uh, routinely exercise and go to work every day and um, do everything anyone else would do. What very often you hear in the media is, is enough to scare the life out of you. Of course, they say if you're just positive, you have AIDS. That, that one's hard to get over, the discrimination and hysteria. Anna discovered she was HIV positive three years ago, but she's sure that she's had HIV since the early 80s in San Francisco, where she took drugs from the age of 14 to 21. I was for a while an intravenous drug, drug user, although it's um, now six, over six years since I um, injected any drugs at all. When I was first diagnosed, I thought, I'm going to die, this is it, um, and I'd been listening to everything that was being said on the television that, I, that we, we were reading in the papers, and the message was, and still is very much, HIV equals AIDS equals death. Since I've known I was positive, since my diagnosis, I've had no health problems at all, really. <laughs> Kaposi's sarcoma, or KS, has always been one of the key diseases associated with AIDS, producing purple lesions on the skin and internally. Sam has KS, but is amongst a growing number of men who have Kaposi's sarcoma but no trace of HIV. At New York University Medical Center, Sam's doctor, Dr. Alvin Friedman Keen, was one of the first physicians to associate Kaposi's sarcoma with AIDS. In the beginning of the epidemic, one of the first things that we noticed was this unusual tumor occurring uh, in gay men. Uh, since that time, of course, we've seen an enormous number of uh, capsi sarcoma uh, cases in patients who were uh, HIV-infected individuals, and more recently discovered that there were several patients who were gay men with capsi sarcoma who were not HIV-infected. Sam had wanted to be tested for HIV because he felt he was leading a high-risk lifestyle, including taking poppers, a dangerous substance called amyl nitrite that is inhaled. I have a, uh, a background of having uh, had uh, a lot of uh, promiscuous uh, sex with both uh, men and women uh, over a period of uh, many years. And with all of the people coming down with uh, AIDS, I thought that I was in a risk group and I had uh, every reason to think that I might uh, have AIDS. I, was, I thought it was even probable that I did. So I was very interested in having an HIV test and uh, I wouldn't really have been surprised if it was uh, positive. Fortunately, it was a negative. Dr. Friedman Keen is convinced that his HIV negative patients do not have AIDS, but a benign form of Kaposi's sarcoma caused by an organism other than HIV. Dr. Robert Ruth Bernstein has been making a special study of KS and believes that Kaposi's sarcoma of itself, without HIV, can produce an irreversible AIDS-type condition. The existence of Kaposi's sarcoma patients who are HIV-negative suggests to me that there are causes of AIDS other than HIV. In fact, I've just completed a 
study of Kaposi's sarcoma that goes back to the very first paper ever published on the subject by Morgan Kaposi in 1872. And it shows that, in fact, there are hundreds of Kaposi's sarcoma patients matching the CDC definition of AIDS for over a century. These patients are not elderly men. These are teenage boys. They are young men in their 20s and 30s. They are often described as being previously healthy. The USA Center for Disease Control's definition of AIDS states that men under 60 with Kaposi's sarcoma who have not been tested for HIV or whose tests are inconclusive have AIDS. Would Dr. Friedman Keen's patients with Kaposi's sarcoma and no HIV be defined as having AIDS? At this particular time, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, and other scientists and, and epidemiologists around the country are reconsidering the definition of AIDS uh, to perhaps change the definition not to include Kaposi's sarcoma as a definitive diagnosis. They once more would have to redefine AIDS. They have to move the goalposts again which they have, they have a lot of practice in that. They have done that almost every year. They have revised and altered the definition of AIDS. They have, every year they have extended the latent period. They have added diseases until 87. Now they start subtracting them again. As the AIDS edifice begins to crumble, more anomalies emerge. UK government predictions, for example, said there would be 17,000 AIDS deaths by 1992. This has now been slashed to 5,000. That's by more than two-thirds. And the number of predicted AIDS cases has been halved. Stage performer Michael Callum has had HIV and AIDS symptoms since 1983. I'm sure that I became infected like most other gay men who have AIDS. I was very, very active in the, in the sexual revolution of the late 70s and early 80s. How is the state of your health in general now? It's a paradox of AIDS. I'm healthier now than I've ever been. I mean, I have Kaposi's sarcoma. I have bacterial pneumonia at least once a year. I've had herpes zoster. Um, I have some immune complex problem, and for a while they thought I had lymphoma. But since I practice safe sex rigorously now, I no longer get the flus and the colds and the drips and the rashes that were part of being a gay man in the 70s and being sexually active, and you just didn't really notice them. Do you think HIV is the cause of AIDS? No, I have never believed that HIV or any other single event, single agent, could account for a disease of this complexity and diversity. Ron Wiebeck has another extraordinary story to tell. In 1985, he was a waiter in Cape Cod when he began to lose vision, couldn't add up properly and started falling over. He was diagnosed as having HIV and an AIDS-related viral brain disease called PML. He became gravely ill. Well, I felt that I was going to die, and I actually asked the doctors uh, to send me home because I wanted to die at home. Well, several weeks had passed, and then I realized that it would be worse if I died without trying. So, and also the fact that I had to try for other people who loved me. So I started fighting back. Ron has made an excellent recovery, and both viruses have completely disappeared. In February of 1989 and June of 1989, I was tested at the National Institute of Health, at which time they found uh, no trace of the AIDS virus or HIV virus in my spinal fluid or in my blood, along with uh, no trace of the JC virus that causes the brain disease. All, uh, both viruses were gone. The threat of the heterosexual spread of AIDS has succeeded in frightening the general public. In some young people's minds, sex now equals death. The heterosexual threat is also used to squeeze more funding for the lucrative HIV-based research projects that are underway. Professor Gordon Stewart, one of the few voices in the UK that has questioned the HIV hypothesis, has made a special study of AIDS predictions. Well, the main prediction was that there would be a tremendous spread by heterosexual transmission. And that has not occurred, not in America, not here, um, as far as I know, not anywhere, Africa or something else. Um, and then the follow-on from that was that there would be, because of that, a global pandemic. 
and that has not happened either. HIV is not behaving like a newly introduced sexually transmitted virus, which would be expected to spread like wildfire. In a recent U.S. Armed Forces survey of over a million 17 to 19 year old men and women, HIV was found very rarely indeed, a steady 0.03% over five years. I seriously doubt that AIDS will become an epidemic in the heterosexual population. Uh, if I'm right that you have to have other cofactors uh, before HIV uh, becomes lethal, or in fact perhaps HIV isn't even necessary, uh, essentially a person who has no risk factors isn't going to get AIDS. At the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, a campaign has been launched to raise $400 million to help fight the spread of AIDS over the next three years. But even the Foundation's press officer admits the actual figures for heterosexual spread are not there. Here in San Francisco, we have yet to see a massive spread of the virus into the heterosexual population. We're still looking at individuals who are injection drug users, uh, individuals who are partners of injection drug users, namely women, as uh, still being the individuals who are primarily getting infected in terms of the heterosexual population. At San Francisco General Hospital, epidemiologist Dr. Andrew Moss admits that there are few hard facts on heterosexual AIDS. We don't know how fast it's spreading heterosexually, and we won't know how fast it's spreading and what's likely to happen without some more knowledge about those areas. How do you feel about the general predictions concerning the spread of AIDS? I think most official predictions about the spread of AIDS have been consistently wrong in this country and in Britain and in the world. And I think uh, there's two reasons for that. One is a lot of very bad science was done, and the other is there are political pressures to have high numbers. All administrative numbers are political, and there's usually an inflation in the upwards direction. And I think it's been hard for people to back away from their high numbers. Inflated predictions involving the transmission of HIV and AIDS through women have had to be revised. Prostitutes were quickly focused on, but a UK survey involving 250 prostitute women over five years at St Mary's Hospital in London showed only three to be HIV positive. Two were intravenous drug users and one the partner of an IV drug user. The three are said to be in good health. AIDS figures are not reliable and AIDS itself is not behaving in the way it's supposed to. In fact, it isn't behaving like an infectious disease at all. I believe that AIDS is not an, or cannot even be an infectious disease. See, an infectious disease, believe it or not, has a certain criteria to it. How it happens, when it happens. For example, if you get infected by a bug or by a virus, within weeks or months after a contact or after that infection you will have symptoms of a disease. In HIV and AIDS, however, we are told you get sick 10 years later, 10 years after infection. That is not how viruses or bacteria even work. They work fast or never. They are very simple mechanisms like a little clock that can do only one thing, go around the dial once and that takes 24 to 48 hours with the virus. There's no way that virus could possibly slow down or wait a week or wait 10 years. That is totally absurd. The second reason why I think AIDS cannot be an infectious disease is there is no precedent, there's no chance that a microbe, particular virus that small, could be that picky, as selective as the cause of AIDS must be. AIDS is restricted ever since we know it to only two major risk groups, not the general population, namely the intravenous drug users and a small percentage of male homosexuals. In my opinion, AIDS is not consistent with an infectious disease. And the reason why is that the risk group proportions have hardly changed at all in the last eight years. In other words, the proportion of AIDS cases accounted for by gay men or by intravenous drug users is virtually identical now to what it was eight years ago. This is a total contradiction with the notion of an infectious venereal disease, the prevailing viewpoint. Infectious diseases always spreads, and yet AIDS has not spread. 
it's remained rigidly compartmentalized. For many scientists, it's difficult to move away from the idea that AIDS is infectious. Recognizing now that HIV can't do the whole job alone, yet not wanting to let HIV go altogether, Professor Luc Montagnier is looking for other infectious agents that might act as cofactors with HIV. He's recently proposed mycoplasmas, which are small bacteria. Perhaps in order to have the disease, we need more than one agent. We need a second in infection by mycoplasma or some kind of specific interaction between the virus and mycoplasma in order to have this burst of uh, destruction of cells we see, we see in AIDS patients. So there are many possibilities still. I think we are still in a very, uh, at the very beginning of understanding AIDS. At the U.S. Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, Dr. Shai Ching Lo has also been working on a separate mycoplasma as a possible cause or cofactor in AIDS. How does Peter Duesberg view these cofactor theories? I think there's no chance for cofactor, an infectious cofactor period, be it a mycoplasma or another virus or bacterium. A mycoplasma you would expect to be effective weeks or months after infection, like all other bacterial infections. And a mycoplasma would spread heterosexually and homosexually alike. It would spread randomly in the population, and AIDS doesn't. Physician and microbiologist Dr. Joseph Sonnabend treats many AIDS patients in New York. He has long made his doubts about HIV known, and believes AIDS stems from multiple factors involving risk behavior that includes infectious components. I would believe that the infectious components are a variety of common or well-known infections, including virus infections such as cytomegalovirus infection, sexually transmitted diseases such as syphilis, and a variety of other common infections which are known to have immunosuppressive components. In, in the cities in which AIDS did occur, there certainly were quite, uh, quite extensive changes, and these were changes of a, of a quantitative nature rather than a qualitative nature, and this simply means that the opportunities for promiscuous or anonymous sex increased enormously as a result the prevalence of different pathogens, different pathogenic organisms increase so that even single exposures will be associated with the acquisition of some infection. But Peter Duesberg maintains the infectious element is a secondary phase. AIDS is primarily not an infectious disease, as I told you. It's primarily a result of, I, sus I suspect, of intoxication. Acquired immunodeficiency, as the word actually says in AIDS, you acquired by consuming drugs malnutrition that is linked to it often or typically linked to it once that has happened once you are immune deficient then you are open to many infections that are secondary or opportunistic as we say that is not therefore an infectious disease it is the result of that what specific factors can bring about the irreversible breakdown of the immune system and are versatile enough to cause other conditions included in the AIDS syndrome. Conditions that have nothing whatsoever to do with immune suppression, like lymphoma, a tumor which can be malignant, encephalitis, a brain inflammation, and Kaposi's sarcoma, which is now thought not even to be linked with HIV. In the 70s, when the gay liberation movement took off, young men flocked to New York and San Francisco where they met up in bathhouses and discos. Writer and chronicler of the gay movement, John Lauritsen, takes up the story. They went to discotheques or uh, leather clubs and other places where they would take drugs. And uh, not just a few drugs, not innocuous drugs, but they might take six different drugs in the course of an evening. And we don't know, really, the, co the consequences of these drugs. But they would include poppers, which are nitride inhalants, MDA, which is a designer drug, even ecstasy and special K, which are other designer drugs. They would include ethyl chloride, a deadly uh, substance which is inhaled. It would include also cocaine and heroin and marijuana and alcohol. And if people took a half a dozen of these things in the course of an evening, who knows what the interaction effects are? Who knows what the long-term effects of any one of them is separately? My hypothesis is that AIDS is caused by non-infectious agents. And the non-infectious agent that I consider most likely as causes of AIDS are in part 
the psychoactive drugs, which are imported and consumed in ever larger quantities ever since the Vietnam War in this country and probably also in Europe. I have always thought, and indeed since 1983 I've been saying, that drugs play a major part in the uh, development of AIDS. Now, they do so in various ways, because there are various kinds of drugs involved, and they don't all apply to the same risk groups. There are, above all, I think, the nitrites, which we know are very toxic indeed to the cellular components of the immune system. I don't think there's any argument about that. And they can cause various other kinds of cellular damage too. I would think that this factor is so important that could, it could in itself produce a um, uh, state of affairs which is not unlike AIDS as we now know it. Apart from the obvious dangers of intravenous drug use, Amyl and butyl nitrites, inhaled while dancing and during sex, used to come in one-dose files called poppers, but were soon available over the counter in screw-top bottles, allowing unlimited inhaled doses. Amyl and butyl nitrites, in the kinds of doses that they are used, particularly by gay men, uh, have been shown in various studies to be immunosuppressive. Do poppers combine with any other drugs that might be being taken? Yes, poppers combine with antibiotics such as penicillin and tetracycline, both in the test tube and in living human beings and animals, to create carcinogens. These may be the cause of Kaposi's sarcoma. If intravenous drugs, poppers, and over-medication with antibiotics play such an important role in AIDS, why have they received so little attention? Why has HIV caught all the attention? The profit motive is very, very powerful here. There are hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars at stake uh, in the HIV hypothesis, or for that matter, in the case of paupers. At one time, the gross profits from paupers were $50 million a year. So therefore, uh, most people can, at least a lot of human beings, can be bought off. Meanwhile, the powerful HIV juggernaut thunders on making more and more claims. Claims, for example, that HIV causes AIDS in needle stick accidents. There is not one single confirmed case of AIDS from a needle stick injury anywhere in the world. There are also claims that HIV causes AIDS and death in the babies of HIV-positive mothers, the majority of whom are intravenous drug users. Through blood transfusions, which are themselves immune suppressant. And in people with haemophilia, a condition also associated with immune suppression. Heterosexually spread HIV is also blamed for the AIDS-type slim disease in Africa. But the manifestations of AIDS in Africa, high fevers, malaria, dysentery and bacterial infections, are very different from AIDS as it's described in the West, and are consistent with pathogenic assault and malnutrition that are already endemic in some third world countries. Vested interests in HIV technology have prevented any proper controlled trials to discover whether HIV really is causing all these diseases. So there's no proof that any of these severely ill patients, grouped together under the HIV AIDS banner, are dying of HIV infection rather than one of the 25 old diseases described as the AIDS syndrome. In the only small trial we could find in people with haemophilia, those who were HIV positive and those who were negative had exactly the same incidence of disease. Yet prejudice, discrimination and fear continue to escalate around HIV. Children and adults with haemophilia, presumed to have been infected with HIV through injection of blood products, are particularly vulnerable to this type of discrimination. University lecturer Dick James has haemophilia. He's been HIV positive for eight years. I have a full-time job, I have friends, I do most of the kinds of things most people do. Uh, I have a very busy life, as a matter of fact. Do you think HIV-positive people are discriminated against? Oh, quite certainly. Uh, discrimination in terms of, of, I'll be charitable, benign neglect uh, by government or government's relative inaction uh, concerning the epidemic, and certainly more more obvious things like the, the increasingly famous uh, immigration laws uh, in the United States that uh, prevent people from coming to our country. There are, of course, uh, less restrictive uh, laws on the books in many countries, and so there are some countries that I find it difficult to travel to also. This is just one example of the gross discrimination shown towards HIV-positive people. 
If HIV has nothing to do with AIDS, and AIDS is not infectious, we are living through one of the biggest scientific errors in history. One of Peter Duesberg's greatest concerns is the fact that HIV-positive people with and without symptoms are being prescribed the highly toxic drug AZT, which can cause bone marrow depletion and symptoms identical to AIDS itself. The mechanism of action of AZT is embarrassingly clear and simple. It is a terminator of DNA synthesis. DNA is the basis for all life on this planet. It's the central molecule in every living cell. Author of a recent book describing the dangers of AZT, John Lauritsen has made a careful study of the AZT drug trials. His findings were originally published in a series of articles in the New York Native. Well, I have examined all of the major studies which are used to claim benefits for AZT. Uh, without exception, I would say these studies prove nothing. They have been, in one respect or another, incompetent and or dishonest. But I would maintain that there is no scientifically credible evidence whatever that ACT has benefits for anybody under any circumstance. What do you think mm. of the current trials looking into the long-term effects of ACT? Yeah, well, I think they will just show, again, that ACT is toxic. If you give less, it will take longer to kill somebody with it or kill its cell susceptible cells with it. And if you take more, it goes faster. So far, no one has lived longer than three years on AZT. And it's very difficult to know whether a patient is dying of AIDS or the toxic effects of the drug. With so many lives at stake, and not a single one saved through the HIV hypothesis, there's been astonishingly little debate about alternative causes of AIDS. Big money invested in HIV technology has had its influence. Have financial interests helped stifle a debate about AIDS? Unfortunately, yes. Yes, uh, their financial interests are very obvious. Most of my colleagues I'm arguing with or debating with or trying to debate with, most of them don't want to dignify me with an answer, are millionaires. Stockholders in companies, consultants, award winners, they win awards at the same rate as Boris Becker and Ivan Lentl. Um, every two or three months they get an award for the virus causing AIDS. So uh, there are orders of magnitude ahead of those who don't believe in the virus hypothesis and live on regular university salaries. It might be difficult for scientists, but why have medical journalists been so slow to contest the received views about HIV and AIDS? Medical journalists in particular seem to think that the public are best served by giving them unadulterated information which comes direct from the government. It's something that, that no other journalist does. I mean, journalists working on economics or on transport want to give both sides of, of the story. And if the government says something, then the first thing they're going to do is ask a question about it. I think it's important to, to question accepted wisdom, and especially in a public health case like this, so I think it's dangerous for the public not to question the conventional wisdom, but it is dangerous for some of the people who speak out most loudly and most authoritatively. If HIV is not the cause of AIDS, the long-term implications could be disastrous. We may end up developing vaccines which will prevent HIV infections but not prevent AIDS. And if AIDS is not infectious, what then? The implications would be very serious, very, very serious, in, in fact. Millions of lives that could have been saved won't be saved if we uh, work on an ungrounded or poorly grounded hypothesis. AIDS prevention, which is now entirely based on preventing contacts with infected people, would take a totally different direction. The community as a whole doesn't listen patiently to uh, critics who adopt alternative viewpoints. Although the great lesson of history is that knowledge develops through the conflict of viewpoints. If you have simply a consensus view, it generally stultifies, it fails to see the problems of that consensus. 
and it depends on the existence of critics to break up that iceberg and to permit knowledge to develop. This is, in fact, one of the underpinnings of democratic theory. It's one of the basic reasons that we believe in notions of free speech, and it's one of the great forces in terms of intellectual development.